Welcome to Game Dev London. I'm Chris Payne, and uh, with me uh, is the man of the legend, uh, Oscar Clark of <laughs> Fundamentally Games. Um, apologies for the uh, slight, uh, slightly off uh, audio quality. But Oscar has uh, had to use his phone because his laptop has died. But uh, well, literally, to... like last night, middle of the you know, just just about to play D and D of all things, and it literally died on me. Uh, so I'm having to uh, do everything by phone at the moment. <laughs> well, uh, we'll muddle through. What we're talking about we today will. is uh, IP licensing um, in all its various forms. Uh, how it can affect, uh, how you can use it to uh, improve sales of games, and uh, interesting anecdotes about uh, IP licensing uh, gone wrong and uh, unusual forms of IP licensing. So. Um, Oscar has worked in the industry for um, a very long time, since uh, 1998. A very long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, as have I, so I thought we would kick off with like the earliest licensed video game that we can remember. Um, now, the, uh, the earliest one that I can remember is the famous E.T., but uh, Oscar has uh, remembers an earlier one. Well, I... Well, I cheated. I I, I was uh, I did some research last night just to make sure I could remember because I have no memory. Um, I discovered a giant bomb article talking about the Fonz, a game I didn't know existed. I think uh, Sega it was the first one I, that they they identified, um, and um, the idea that they made a motocross kind of uh, changed up game and it was based around the Fonz and Happy Days. Uh, for those of us who remember that uh, era, the, the very TV show where Jumping the Shark came from. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's interesting that, that that's as far. I also remember the, um, the like I say, you talk about ET. Uh, I was lucky enough to um, be at a conference in Ottawa, of all places, where Howard Scott, uh, what's his name? Howard, Howard Scott Warshaw, that's it, that's his name. Um, he was doing a talk about the infamous ET. But it wasn't the first one. He did. He worked on uh, Indiana Jones on the Atari 2600. Uh, again, a notoriously not great game, but <laughs> it was a success, that one. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it was a fascinating. I mean, he, he has some fascinating stories to tell about um, the alleged game that killed the Atari. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to tell you more about that if you're interested. Oh, yeah. Um... I mean that sounds that sounds interesting because uh, obviously um, licensed games have um, a reputation uh, as being kind of poor quality, sort of like cheap cash ins, or they they had, um, and it'd be interesting to sort of like go through how that has um, how that came about and how it developed uh, over the years because there have been some exceptionally good games that really leaned into their license and did a fantastic. Uh, job uh so yeah um but the majority i would argue are compromised for two reasons one is they just spent most of their dev budget to get the license so they've got to do what they can with what's left the other one is that they're not coming from a place of the creator of the license they're coming from a place of the observer of the license in in the poor cases so it's much harder to make a game of something where you're having to lock into the rules and the guidelines and the brand um, statements that's owned by somebody who doesn't understand games. Yeah. And at the same time, still create something which plays like a gamer would want to play. It's it's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, you and I have both like worked on um, licensed games, and mm -hmm. it is a struggle to um, to come up with something that that you don't have as much creative freedom working with an IP um, as you would uh, creating your own game. So it, it's if it's an original title, it's quite easy to... If you need to introduce a new game mechanic, then uh, you can just sort of like introduce that mechanic and then adjust, the, adjust your game's lore to incorporate yeah. that mechanic so that everything works. Uh, that can be very difficult to do mm. with, uh, with an IP, especially if that IP has certain mechanics that are expected to be there and have to be incorporated into the gameplay in some way but um so it even gets worse because um i mean i'm going to use a, okay it's, it's still another game but when they first did sonic the hedgehog mm. um on mobile on java uh, you know on the old mobile um phones before the iphone yeah um i remember the guys 
we were desperate to get you know Sonic on a phone. Great, give it to us, give it to us. But they refused to let it out for a long time because the pixel um, ratio of the eye was wrong. So it was black where it should have been white and white where it should have been black. It was like one pixel, well, two pixels that were swapped. And that just held the whole thing up for, for, for weeks and weeks because just the level of, of I, okay, maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but the level of pernickettiness that the, the, the brand owners have mm. because to them, the absolute necessity is to be perfect. And it's, yeah. a, it's not the same as the uh, of, as the enjoyment of the game or the need that a games yeah. company might have to get the thing out. See, for, for me, I would have thought that on uh, um, uh, old mobile devices, I, um, I, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean sort of like early mobile days. Early, yeah, very yeah, early, yeah. Like so I, for me, the, five maybe. Yeah, the like the the key feature of Sonic is that it's fast, and doing that on mobile mm. must have been quite a challenge. It was. Yeah. <laughs> they did a quite a good job of it, to be honest. Um, it wasn't something that was going to run on all the devices. No. Uh, but yeah, it's, and they did a very limited experience of it as well. It wasn't it wasn't quite the Sonic we know and love, but oh yeah, it was it was interesting. Yeah. Um, but in the, even in the best of worlds, even when you do have free reign, so um, you know, we we've got I still own the well, not own, I still have the rights to the Rocky Horror Show. And despite you know having a successful Kickstarter, getting some investment, and all this other stuff, just the very process of making a good game is difficult. And you know when you make you know when you fall into problems and you run out of money, you can't often just complete the game. So even with the best will of the world, uh, you can't always you know deliver what you want to. You know especially yeah. The game that you're passionate about because you're so keen to get it just right um and sometimes it falls flat it, it it can happen speaking of which uh so um i'm interested to find out what what the uh the backstory to uh et and uh, indiana jones mm. on the atari are because this would be the the early days of the in industry um, oh yeah and we're talking about the 80s aren't we uh, 70, 79 i think oh, et was no you're right yeah. You're right. My goodness, it's seventies. Goodness, I've, see, I'm I'm not, I'm not so old. I can't even remember what time looks like. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. Seventy nine. Um, I think seventy six was the Fonz or something like that. Um, and obviously the game that came after that, which um, how it's got um, Werner. Anyway, um, what he did, he obviously they took the uh, classic Atari game Adventure, and they repurposed it with the story based around Indiana Jones. And um, um, what was interesting about that is they had very, very little time to do it, uh, obviously, you know, because, you know, things coming out, got to get it ready for Christmas, all this kind of stuff. But they managed to pull it off for the Indiana Jones game. Um, with E.T., e um, apparently Spielberg liked what they did with, um, with um, Indiana Jones and wanted to do something with E.T., but it had to be out for the, you know, um, the um, Thanksgiving period. Mm -hmm. so that gave them five weeks wow so imagine that five weeks okay so okay we're going to reskin the uh indiana jones game with uh, you know with et this is what um how it described um and uh, you know, it's just fascinating but it was brutal you know uh, and this is basically you know the days where there was basically one or two people on a team as well so we thought, thought about five weeks one or two people mm. And it was crazy, you know, working constantly. And the funny thing is, it functioned after the five, well, I think it was six weeks he actually took to do it. Yeah. Uh, and it was functional, so you could play it. Now, it wasn't a good experience. Um, it did have problems and bugs, but it did actually function. So, for me, that's a triumph. That's amazing. But... Um, you know, again, because it wasn't a great game, because Atari had basically um, overpromised and mm. produced far too many of them. But it wasn't just them; they buried a whole bunch of, of unsold games in the middle of the desert. Which I, uh, you can go and find the documentary. There's a documentary yeah. out there. I think Howard's in that uh, documentary as well. But it's just fascinating to me to sit there. And he's basically been blamed with the death of Atari for decades. He left the games industry as a result. I forgot what he did. I think 
he did therapy stuff. Oh, I mm. can't actually remember off the top of my head. Um, so here's a guy claim, you know, who's now owning, who's taken back ownership of making the worst game of all time. Uh, and um, I, I, I found the guy fascinating, genuinely fascinating. And uh, I mean, what a horrendous experience for him. Yeah. But actually, what an amazing job he must have done to have got something functional within five weeks. That that's a that's a pretty impressive um, accomplishment, yeah. to be honest. But it does highlight some of the key problems. So mm-hmm. number one, in expectations, the expectations yes. that are set for a game like that are just enormous. Number two, time frames. You're not in charge of the time frame when you've got a big brand like ET that's coming out and they need a Thanksgiving Christmas release there is hard hard deadlines you cannot slip which means that you've got to change scope but when you've only got five weeks what scope is there to get rid of yeah yeah and budget they couldn't just chuck money at it it doesn't matter how much money you had you can't change five weeks from being five weeks and if you chuck more people at it it takes longer yes because you've got to get people up to speed You you know this is the classic dilemma you know money does not equal time no it it yeah, not always. Over the long always, term, it can, but in the short term, yeah, no. What's the, it's the classic thing, isn't it? You've got you know time, money, and quality. Yes, you can have two, but you can't have all three. Yeah, 